everyone. It's Dr. Tofi. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live, our weekly episodes of uh, hernia-related topics with me, your host, Dr. Sharin Tofi. As you know, many of you are here as a Facebook Live, some Zoom. Um, thanks for following me on Facebook at Dr. Tofi. And at the end of the session, as always, this and all prior Hernia Talk Live sessions will be archived on my YouTube channel at Hernia Doc. So today we've got a great guest, very unique topic, unlike previous topics, Dr. Amir Zold. I've known him for, I would say at least 10 years, maybe longer. He is a colleague and surgeon of mine based in Israel, but more importantly for today is that he is a surgeon inventor, which I love because I, I feel like um, people who think like inventors are just uh, more unique people. And so you can follow him at Amiki SZ on Twitter, and please provide a very warm welcome to Amir, or as your as your friends call you, Amiki. That's your nickname. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Hi, thanks. how are you? Thanks for joining us. It's 10 p.m. Israel time right now, so I do appreciate the evening <laughs> devotion. Thank you so much. We just, we just we just start partying at this time, so we're fine. We're gonna start partying. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, so we saw each other in Barcelona at the European Hernia Society meeting, and we were talking, and uh, you gave a fantastic lecture, fantastic talk uh, as part of like the technology session and the robotic session, because you have an invention which is going in the reverse direction as most people. So most people are going big. $2 million robot, and you're saying, hold on, most of the world does not can't afford a $2 million robot, but we can improve what we have. And uh, you talked about your, your instrumentation, which is kind of mimicking the robotic technology, but at a smaller scale. And what I loved absolutely from your talk was your analogy with the motorcycle. So a lot of people talk about the robot as like, the Ferrari or the, I, I gave it as the SUV. It's kind of like a unique car. It's very expensive and uh, takes a lot of room and very high end. And you're saying, I loved your analogy. You said, okay, how about a motorcycle? Why can't we have a motorcycle? It's low in cost. It takes up very little space and you can zoom everywhere you want, where cars and SUVs <laughs> cannot take you. So uh, let's start from there, because uh, I thought that was genius, the the uh, the motorcycle analogy, because no one said that before, at least not that I've heard. So the idea is that uh, I'm sure robotic surgery in many forms is going to be around for, for the next a long time. So, and I think that... Uh, it gives you, it gives the surgeon the ability to perform complex motions more easily and it gives them better control, uh, especially compared to the instruments that we use on a daily basis, which are really poorly designed. Yeah. But I think on the other hand, that especially when we speak about hernia, hernia is a very common problem. It's very common around the world. Uh, it affects many times people at the working age, which takes them away from work, takes them away from daily life. And uh, and I think that uh, very expensive ways of fixing a hernia uh, are not sustainable in our world. Even no. Not, in, in, not, not even in any way. So I believe we should... Uh, We're getting we should you find cut out a little bit. My audio is not best. I'm sorry. I would also say that I would also say that uh, what happens is hernia is a a, a worldwide problem, uh, and what we see in lower income countries is they just don't get it repaired, and then you end up as a child, and you end up as an adult with these humongous hernias. And it can be a huge burden and affect their ability to work and sustain a family. And, you know, I thought it was very unique at the European hernia meeting. Uh, 
there was a whole day devoted to robotics. And I was told something like only 4% of European surgeons uh, do robotic surgery. I think even less. Maybe even less. I joke yeah. that I joke that my hospital, which has nine robots and probably will <clears throat> have more. <laughs> uh, my hospital probably has more robots than many of the countries represented at the uh, European Hearing Society meeting. Yeah, in Israel, there are 12 robots. In the entire country? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's 12 robots, more than 12 within a, a mile radius of my hospital. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so your invention uh, currently is of a kind of a mechanicized, mechanized... No, it's not mechanized. Uh, it's, ro it's completely robotic. It's, it has motors and computer and, and everything. Inside. It's just very small. That's true. And it, it, it's handheld as opposed to being yes. a separate machine that you have to roll into the room and take space. That's what we, we call it human extensions because it's like an extension of your hand. That's a robotic true. extension of your hand. It's that's like true. A... And, and do you think that that's the, I mean, I assume you think that that's the future is to move away from these big bulky um, robots and come up with something more practical at the bedside. I think so. I think so. I think uh, in order to make it both sustainable and even logistically, with that you can do many cases and not have to roll things in and roll things out and dock things and you know get a technician to do it. It slows the process very much, and we need to we need to operate a lot of people. A lot of people need surgery, especially in hernia. Look. Yeah. <clears throat> There are many diseases that are basically not mechanical. So cancer is a cellular disease. So, so we we'll probably people will figure out all, all kinds of ways that are not just removing tumors. We'll be yes. operate, we'll be using biological diseases and irradiation and many things. But hernia is completely mechanical. There's no other way to fix a hernia than to fix a hernia. Yeah. It's, it's you have to you have to fix it like it's like a you know it's like a flat tire there's no there's no medication that you can give a flat tire to fix it true and there are lots of them and there are lots of them like really lots of them millions and millions of them so many yeah um now you've had a lot of inventions prior to this uh right. do you want to just were they all in the hernia world or not somewhere. Well, I think there's one product that's very, very ubiquitous in the US. That's my invention, which is the echo balloon that opens up the mesh uh, for ventral hernia repair. Holds the mesh that's in place. Yeah. Um, Bard. Uh, now it's a uh, Becton BD. Yes, Becton Dickinson. Uh huh. And there are some ideas that I invented that failed. There's, I think they're still good idea, but. But, but but commercially they failed in, in fixation and I'm currently helping a company that makes a self-adhesive mesh uh, which is I think it's a cool thing yeah so you don't need to you don't need to fix it with any mechanical means to where it should be and what are some of the other non-hernia inventions you've been involved in oh I was involved in a company that makes laparoscopic simulators Oh, I remember Symbionics, that. Mm -hmm. which is very now the biggest oh, very company. Very successful. Very successful company. Uh, I was involved with a company that did an, a bowel anastomosis and burned $70 million and shut down. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. and I was involved in companies that, well, tons of things. In MRI safe instruments. Uh, 21 companies, basically, so far. That's amazing. A, a company that is making, uh, that was bought by by Medtronic that does the fluorescence, for Met the fluorescence camera for Medtronic is a company that I was involved with, started 25 years ago. And what is your background? Do you have an engineering background? No, I'm a surgeon. I, 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 I keep on being a very active uh, clinical surgeon. I do... I, Tell them how many operations you're doing this week. 25, 23. 23, 23. in one week. If a surgeon yeah, is 23 do. in a month, that's like a really good month in the United States. I do, uh, 
No, I do. I do eight hundred to a thousand cases a year. And that's in addition to all the traveling you do to all the different meetings. Yeah, and keeping you away my, from uh, clinical. You well, know, the the thousand was during COVID because I didn't travel, <laughs> but basically. Oh, wow. So the, it's more like eight hundred when I travel. Plus the inventions. So when you when you do these inventions, you come up with an idea and you you have a team that helps you, or it's it's just you. And it's so it depends. Works. Depends. Uh, uh, some of the some of them I joined. I guess somebody else who had the idea. I just helped them, you know, from the clinical point of view, usability and things like that. And some of them were ideas that, uh, like the ro robot, is an idea that started from my head. And then I convinced some friends to join me. Some of them were engineers, and some of them were people from finance, and we formed the company. And I work there uh, one day a week and a lot more, you know, over email and Zoom meetings and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I remember you when you, I think you found me at Sages a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, I was blown away with that. I thought it was great. Your invention was fantastic. I'm sure it's even better uh, now that you've had a couple extra years with it but. and where where the are are it seems like what my theory is right because the place where it really is uh, seems to be very successful is india india yeah it's now started there it's being marketed by a very big company called merrill and mm, yeah a lot, of, a lot of people want it yeah i think the the beauty of of your instrument is you know, there's a lot we can we can't do laparoscopically we would like to right laparoscopic mm -hmm. surgery is less invasive less scarring cosmetically better uh short-term recovery seems to be easier for patients and <clears> so <throat> on but we're technically technologically limited yeah. right yeah, um so the other option is to do things open surgery and sometimes you have to do that but then if you can find something that can take all your laparoscopic surgery and do it better, but all the open surgery and still be able to do it laparoscopically, then uh, that's kind of where, where your instrument falls in, which is really, really great. Um, yeah. And then when you, do you often make the device your, as part of your group or do you sell your idea? No, no. Uh, well, I always, I all, all the in all the companies that I started or I was in, involved with as a co-founder or as a advisor, uh, you build the company to a certain size and then you either sell it or you go public or or you sell. It's, you can't sell just the idea. It's too, not from Israel. It's, we're too far away and too small. Got it. So you have to get involved in production of at least a first generation of your product. Well, I'm involved. I, I don't produce it myself, you know, but uh, but I've involved, I'm involved in everything, design, production, everything as, as a user. Got it. Uh, there's just a, uh, just a question since we brought up MRI, if we can use noise canceling headphones uh, in the MRI. I believe they do have uh, noise canceling headphones that are MRI safe that the radiologists use. Yeah, but the noise there is really strong. It's very difficult it to cancel it. And it's not it's only true. noise, there's also a vibration that your body feels. So. Vibration, sometimes heat. Yeah. 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 MRIs are difficult. I never figured out why it causes so much noise. Is that all the electrons moving in one direction it causes noise? No, it's the magnet. The magnets, huge magnets rolling around. But why does that cause noise? It's like a huge piece of metal running running around you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so we have some questions that I'd like to to uh, go through. A lot of it, the, the questions that were sent over have to do with robotic surgery. Uh, this one, I think you're one of the best people to answer is, how, what do you see in the evolution of robotic and laparoscopic surgery? <clears throat> Uh, you mean in, in hernia, in hernia or in general? Uh, mostly hernia, but yeah. Because I think in 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 hernia it's important because I think in hernia, uh, robotics will be more ubiquitous, cheaper, 
Yeah. Uh, sometimes there will be several comp several robots that are more fitted to do hernia repair and some that are less fitted to do hernia repair. Uh, so there's going to be many options that are being much more cost effective. And I think therefore uh, in some form or in many forms, uh, robots are still going to be here for a long time, especially for hernia repair. They will guide surgeons how to do the operation safer. They will have a big, a better brain. So it's not going to be just a mechanical system or an electromechanical system that enables you to do mm -hmm. complex motion, but it will also be like a co-pilot. It will tell you, watch out, this is this. Watch out, this is that. Don't put... Uh, the mesh is not placed right. You don't have enough margin. Oh, nice. Uh, so there's there's going to be um, some brain behind it, not just... Uh, I think the surgeon will still be doing the operation. I think we're very, very far from autonomous surgery. Yeah. And also, I, th I don't think it's so bad. Uh, but I think both for the decision making and for perfecting your operation, you're going to be, you're going to have a robot that's going to be, your, in a way, your co-pilot. Wow. So. This is kind of like with the cars... You can turn on a system where it tells you that uh, you know you're off the lane. Yeah, so it's like it's it's actually the, I mean I think the analogy is very good because because you know there was a huge hype about self-driving cars, but mm -hmm. very few people really use self-driving cars for for doing the entire thing. Yeah, and there's been a lot of questions about self-driving cars. You know the ethics and the the the, the, the liability thing. So I think the same goes for robots, but they will have there'll be a lot more assisted driving so it will keep you in right. lane it will warn yeah. you if something bad's going to happen yeah it's it will suggest to take a different route it's going to yeah. be it's very very similar to to a very good uh, not self driving car but with assist very good assisted driving yeah i mean uh my car not you can turn it on or off i turn it off because uh, the steering wheel kind of shakes if i'm over a line you know yeah Mm -hmm. um but yeah if i'm making a turn and it thinks i'm going straight to like a an object it'll it'll make it stop you and yeah yeah oh, it will even stop you yeah if i get too close to a car it'll stop me yeah, absolutely stop you. so yeah. in a way in a way think of it uh, good point a robot a robot that. no matter no matter what kind of robot if it's connected to the visualization system which most of them are could be your you're a very good co-pilot I like that where they, surgeon. you know, a lot of the hernia surgery that I see, the the mesh is not is poorly placed. Um, I kind of like that. Maybe there'll be a standardization that the mesh needs to be higher or lower. Or it's too wrinkled, you know. Dissect more. Oh, it will. Oh, it will mark. It will mark the area that you should cover. Should put it in. Oh my god. Um, what do you think of the the U.S. some U.S. surgeons' addiction to the robot? They I feel like they can't do anything unless there's a robot nowadays. Well, it's problematic. You know, when people come up and tell me, you know, uh, robots robots will be so. They say smartphones started like that too. It used, used to be ex very very expensive. Only very uh, rich business people could afford a smartphone. A, yeah. You know, a, a cell phone, and then it became so ubiquitous. Yeah, but you know, the first smartphone was around in 2007 and the first robot was around in 1999. And the robots hardly change. I mean, they're they're better, but the, the actual configuration of the robot, what it does, how it works, and the cost is only increased. It didn't decrease. So it's not the same story as a smartphone. So I think I think that being dependent on a robot makes you in a way, a little crippled. It's like having a car and not be able to walk. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, here's a, a, a similar question in the same line. Uh, again, talking about the robots. So we're talking about some type of machine learning, I guess, uh, with semi-autonomous surgical, surgical robots. I like how you call it co-pilot. Um, so what do you think are some of the challenges not technologically, but maybe ethically, are we going to be training residents that don't really know how to operate? If there's a complication and there's bleeding and you have to convert to open, do people not know how to do that anymore? That's one of the concerns we have as people involved in residency training. Um, so I think that, uh, that uh, 
surgical training should include being able to deal with catastrophes yeah. in, in, any, in all ways that will be appropriate for the specific situation. So I think this, you know, surgeons in training should be also trained in trauma, not because they're going to be trauma surgeons, but because they can learn how to use, how to deal with catastrophic events during uh, elective surgery. Right. Uh, I even encourage uh, people who train with me uh, to do a rotation in transplant surgery because there you learn anatomy extremely well because it's like very, very extensive operations and you learn a lot of techniques of exposure. Uh, and I think about the question that was there, that semi-autonomous, so you can, you can actually automate some parts of the operation mm -hmm. or make them make semi, I wouldn't make it same, I wouldn't call it semi-autonomous. I think it would be more uh, guiding systems, uh, defining no-fly zones in your, mm -hmm. in your yeah. working field. Uh, and this, we are very close to, I think probably five years, we're going to be seeing very good system to show you. There's already systems out there, uh, but specific for, for specific cases, for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the, the systems that show you whether you achieve the, the right, you know, the right view to safely clip and cut whatever you need to clip and cut, cut in laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So I think this is going to be the round. And so this does not, and it does not necessarily have to be a part of a robot. It could be just a part of, you know, your camera uh, that will have the brain. Uh, in yeah. a robot, it can also limit your motion. Camera just can, you know, if you connect the camera to uh, to AI, it will tell you, don't go there, don't go there, but it can't stop you. But a robot can actually stop you from going there. Yeah, it's so interesting. My first car that I had that actually was somewhat smart, uh, you know, it would beep if there was something nearby. Uh, right so you don't hit it and <laughs> i wasn't used to hearing the beep and i didn't see that there was this one mirror like jutting out from the wall uh and as i was coming backwards with the car it would start beeping 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 the beeping got louder and faster until i eventually crashed into the this little mirror um because i just ignored it i didn't even know but the car obviously knew better than me based on the sensors that it had now now your brain is trained to listen to all the different alarms that you have both uh in cars and other things um uh, really quickly one of the questions that, that are live again talks about the mris do earplugs i don't know if you're the mri specialist now yeah. <laughs> um maybe you can answer this do earplugs reduce noise or just aggravate volume by bone conduction no they, give, they give me earplugs all the time it actually reduces the noise because they're um they don't conduct they're like little foam pieces. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, going back to your own invention, here's a question: uh, Are there enhancements of conventional laparoscopic instruments, which is basically uh, uh, similar to your your human? That's exactly my device. Yeah. It is right. <laughs> what is it? This this slide is exactly the description of our device. Yeah, it retains the advantages of robotic surgery. It increases degrees of freedom from typical laparoscopic instruments. Uh, I don't know about the 3D visualization. 3D visualization you can you can you can buy separately. There are systems that that are 3D that are separate from robotic systems. True. I use uh, them. Motion scaling, increased precision. That's all of what yours use, and reduces the costs. So our system costs. You can buy 25 systems uh, of our systems for the cost of one big robot. So. Uh, so so the answer is yes. And I'm sure that our system is not going to be the only one there. Just, we just started. So I think, I think good ideas tend to be, tend to spread. Yes, that's correct. That's so true. Um, you know, AI is like a big deal right now. We're talking about AI. Uh, taking exams and writing reports and so on. What, what's your thoughts about AI and assisting surgery? So this, this question is about augmented reality and augmented reality has been now routinely used for many cases because for instance, when you have a, when you use a fluorescent system that shows you near infrared light that you can see and it's a, over a, cast on your screen, this is actually augmented reality because you're seeing 
not the reality that you can see with your own eyes, but you can see more another layer of a near infrared light that can show you fluorescence, that can show you important structures in surgery and highlight them so you don't harm them or that you, you harm them if you want to harm them, but you know exactly where they are. So they can show you uh, bile ducts, they can show you ureters, they can yeah. show you all kinds of things. And I think more and more of these technologies come into the market. There's something that's called hyperspectral analysis, hyperspectral cameras that show you a very wide range of, uh, of the unseen spectrum. And from that range, you can pick different uh, uh, wavelengths that show you and highlight different things. Nerves, for instance, is an important thing or blood vessels within fat or disease tissue like cancer cells. And, and that is already coming into the market soon. Some of it is already there. So I think, yes, we're going to be using augmented reality and a lot of it. So, so basically, if you think of it, technology enhances what... The, we have three things that, uh, that, that, that work while we perform surgeries. So we have mm -hmm. the sensing, which is usually our eyes. Some of it is tactile sensing. We have the processing, which is our brain. And we have the action, which is our hands and our tools. All of these could be enhanced with technology. The sensing could be enhanced with different, with tech, better te tactile systems, with better uh, cameras. The processing could be enhanced with AI, which will act as some kind of a co-pilot. And the performance, the actual, the action can be enhanced with different robotic systems. Uh, I know there's augmented reality that's used for like detecting cancer so that the tumor that you remove, let's say colon resection, you make sure that you're within a certain uh, range of, you know, tumor cells that you wouldn't necessarily see with your eye that may be submucosal and so right. on. When I was at USC, uh, I started a project on image guided surgery because they do it for neurosurgery, brain and spine but it had not leaked over to general surgery. And I really thought that would be the, the next thing. But then I left the university and handed that off to others. But, you know, I, I always say, if I'm in the operating room looking for something, it would be so awesome if I knew where I was based on the CAT scan or the MRI. <laughs> Tell me exactly, do I make a left? Do I make a right? You know? So um, there are systems now. Uh, yes. There's a beautiful project that started in, in France in Strasbourg that's called the Visible Patient. Mm -hmm. where you feed the CT scan or the MRI of the patient into the system, and then you can project it in real time during surgery on the screen and use augmented reality. It's still difficult to do, but I think we're going there. So you're going to be working uh, with, with, uh, with augmented reality, showing you vital organs or tumors within, within your visual fields when you work. So yes, it's going there. Yeah. Uh, the, the hiccup we had was that um, for spine and brain, you know, those those don't move with breathing or heart, yeah, heart they're beating. They're in, they're in, yeah. yeah, so we start with a vascular model because that's also less likely to move around. But intestines and liver and all that, they, they move a lot. So that was kind of the issue of trying to correct for that, the movement factor in real life. Uh, here's another another question, and it says, "How should a surgeon decide if it's worth learning a new new um, technology, and especially those that are not really widely adopted? And then, how do we determine whether it's it's worthwhile? Because just because there's new technology doesn't mean that it's it's worthwhile to move forward with it. What are your thoughts about that?" So that's actually a very, very good question because uh, in one hand, surgeons want to be updated and, uh, and uh, move more forward with technology. On the other hand, surgeons are, uh, are uh, usually pretty conservative about, especially if they do something very well. So yeah. there's always a ten there is al always a tension between these two tendencies. One is to progress and the other is to abandon something that you do very well or something yeah. that possibly will help you do it better but only possibly so there the thing is that data accumulates by studies you know surgeons do studies surgeons go to meetings surgeons uh, you know share information between them and they figure it out together but it takes time so many things that started and somehow died there was a big hype and they died there was a lot of 
you know, there was a lot of things talk about uh, uh, transluminal surgery, removing the gallbladder through the stomach and removal of the gallbladder uh, through the vagina and all yeah. the crazy things that were, were done 10 years ago and was completely abandoned. Although patients were operated and some of them were very happy. Yeah. But because it was cumbersome and didn't show a very big advantage and was not pushed hard, so it it sort of like died away. But uh, in a way, the, the, the robotic surgery is very appealing to patients because it, it sounds like you would expect, you know, from watching science fiction movies and from looking at robots, you know, making cars and, and production lines and robotic systems in space, you expect robots to be much more precise and much better. But what we're using is not really a robot, you know, it's 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 a system it's like a very expensive car with a driver. If the driver yes. is stupid, if the driver is bad, the the currently the, the robotic systems will not help him become a, you know, if his decision making is bad, it wouldn't help him do any better decisions. It'll just help him to do bad things more precisely. <laughs> That's very true. One of the things, was it you that brought up the question of whether we'd be more tolerant of uh, a human surgeon making a mistake versus uh, a robot making a mistake i i put we that are question. but we are because as a society because we are human and because we you know we sympathize with other humans and we understand how it is to make an error because we make them we make them ourselves we are very tolerant to human error because we live in within human error all the time but we are completely intolerant to machine error. And it's also that they're all, they're very difficult questions to answer, mm -hmm. especially liability, for instance. If if a robot tells you, I'm not even saying about may, does, but only gives you advice to do something in surgery based on 100,000 procedures, and it's still wrong. Who's <laughs> liable? And you make a bad decision because of a suggestion of a, of, of a movement or, or a strategy during surgery, based on, on, you know, millions of operations analyzed by AI, and you make yeah. a decision using that, who is liable, you are, or the system, who, you know, the, the, the programmer, the guy, the code writer who wrote the code, or who, who the company that makes the, the computer, Yeah. who's liable, who takes responsibility for that. So these, you know, uh, our society and our legal systems and our ethics are left behind by technology. I mean, technology moves forwards much faster and it's the, the, the pace is increasing, leaving the changes that we have to do in our, in our legal systems, in our education, and way behind. And we have to adopt everything to that quick, much quicker. Legislation, politics, yeah. policy, make, policy making, education should change according to technology. What's the status of uh, robotics, not just robotics, but like advanced technologies in just everyday surgical care in Israel? It's as advanced as everywhere else, but it's not, we were, we we're much more careful about resources. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, there are, it's much more controlled. It's just not just an open market. And most of medicine in Israel is not for profit. Got it. So, it's socialized, so. government-based? It's uh, not exactly government based, but it's it's the the insurance there. There is a national health insurance, and there are two layers above it that are semi private and private insurance that Got you it. can to complement it. But basically, everybody in Israel is covered well, covered very well. Then there's no, you know, including uh, complex surgery and advanced medications for cancer and advanced uh, therapy and everything. But if you want to. For instance, if you want to choose your surgeon or if you want to go to a fancier hospital, that's an extra buck or better insurance. But there's no such thing as somebody without very good basic insurance. So you don't have so people going have to, bankrupt for healthcare reasons? Zero. Never. Yeah. Ever. Never. So let's go back to, to hernias because that's what we do with... <laughs> yeah. Uh, our audience is mostly mostly interested in hernias and so on. You mentioned the uh, potential future pro projects with uh, advances in hernia surgery. Well, one is your human extensions because 
similar to the advances in robotic surgery, we're now able to do much more advanced operations uh, that we were not able to do before. And mm -hmm. that allows for better hernia surgery, <clears throat> shorter recovery time, less wounds to heal. And uh, those of us that do robotic surgery found that that there's a specific segment of the population that, um, or segment of the surgical techniques that do much better robotically. And so I still do laparoscopic surgery in addition. You know, I don't do a typical ingle hernia robotically. And one thing that I like about your instrument is I'm not a big fan of these big eight millimeter incisions of the robot. Yep. Uh, I use five millimeter and, you know, in some patients, three millimeter uh, Me too. Me too. Uh, instruments. Yeah. You don't need big incisions and big incisions can cause uh, ugly scars and potentially hernias. So that's one of the drawbacks I feel is with these highly advanced technologies is you lose some of the delicacy and daintiness of that I like about surgery. I agree. I completely agree. And also for me, it's also time saving not to use a robot because I operate much quicker without a robot. Both and because you, of the docking and the undocking and the whole logistics around it. Yes. And the actual surgery, it slows me down. Actually, in the actually performing surgery, it slows me down. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, but your instruments are five millimeter at this time. Is that correct? No. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Five. You also mentioned the uh, the self adhesive mesh. How is that more beneficial than the ProGrip technology? It's it's not mechanical. So in the ProGrip technology, there's a lot of wound, there's a lot of tissue reaction around these little hooks that hold the mesh in place. Mm -hmm. And I found uh, uh, meshes that stick to the surface using these little hooks, like Velcro. Uh, and scar tissue grows around these little hooks, like the Velcro hooks. Got and it. Um, I think that in some patients, it can cause a lot of scarring, very heavy scarring and some pain. So I'm not very big fan of uh, self adhesion. And also, it's it's for the surgeon, they're sometimes cumbersome to use to open and put in place and move it after very you put cumbersome. it in place. Yeah. So, but you know, there's there, there's definitely room for that, but uh, I don't I don't use this stuff. So. Self adhesive is, and uh, the idea is this the system the mesh is sticky to a very small degree, so we can still move it around. And then you do something to actually fix it in place you know, with different chemicals or light or something like that. And it's much more biological. <laughs> Got it. So the glue part doesn't activate immediately. You have to oh, yeah. turn it on somehow. Yeah. After you're confident in the place. After, after you, mesh. yeah, that, that's the idea. And is it? Yeah, there, there's some idea that having the entire, like from a physics standpoint, having the entire surface uh, adherent is better than the way we used to do it, which was you put sutures and um, specifically tack areas and then allow, hope that the rest of the mesh integrates. What are your thoughts on I that? I think that uh, the surgeons are thinking in very mechanical uh, simplified mechanical thinking and they are mm -hmm. they're they are they're not aware of the amazing powers of our body to to fix things and by itself so i think if a, if the reaction to a, the mesh is good and there is fast incorporation of the mesh it's incredibly strong and very quickly uh, much quicker than we expect it so I'm not sure that you need to really fix the entire surface of a mesh to the abdominal wall. This hasn't, it has never been proved, uh, to my knowledge. And I think that if the mesh is made from a material, and that's that's something we need to work on, if the mesh is made yeah. from a material that incorporates well into the body, but still, you know, maintains its strength for a long time, that's something that, that will work much better than any fixation, if the mesh is big enough. And that that's actually something that 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 that's one of the technologies that I think we're still way back, uh, uh, which is mesh because yeah. we're using we're using. Uh, I think that in the U.S. there's a lot of uh, there's overreaction to mesh, and there are a lot of people making uh, having an interest for people not to like meshes because they you know they they're involved in lawsuits and yeah. they can make money and. 
So I think the fear from mesh is completely exaggerated, but I think that the meshes with ears are not ideal. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they create foreign body reaction. They, they cause pain sometimes, the scar tissue. And it's not because only of the mesh. It's also because it's very, very patient, patient dependent. So some patients with the exact same mesh, That's same correct. mesh, some patients would cause terrible scarring and will suffer from pain. And some, and some patients will be perfectly incorporated, although the technique and the mesh are exactly the same. So meshes are something that we need to work on, I think. And I, I don't think that, you know, biological meshes, the current biological meshes are good enough because they slowly become scar tissue and scar tissue is weaker than normal tissue. What we should yes. try, try to invent is a mesh that will completely mimic normal, healthy fascia or normal, healthy muscle and will cover a defect. So do you predict what will be moving away from permanent implants? I think we will, moving, I will be mo we will be moving to, to other permanent implants so that mm. will be a permanent biological scaffold that will that will be replaced by human but our by our tissue but that we can control what kind of tissue will be there you know i don't so know if, if you remember when life cell first came out with alloderm back in like 2000 1999 2000 that was their thing oh you whatever you sew it to this will be a scaffold and then your body will start yeah, but it doesn't infiltrate it never did it never did but yeah. you're predicting that at some point we may be able to regenerate tissue um, by providing a scaffold that'll have something tissue. in it that will that will that will that will you know make your body build uh, the actual wall that you need there and well, hopefully it will be even functional and functional yes uh, what are your thoughts about future um synthetic uh, mesh implants, newer products, newer materials? So there are some products already that are just not, not, not approved in the US that are uh -huh. much more uh, friendly to human tissues uh, that are synthetic, but currently they're only available in Europe and Asia, not in the US. So... Like the PVDF? Yes, I think it's a much more, more friendlier uh, synthetic material, you know, doesn't it creates a lot less aggressive scar tissue and yeah. very nice immune growth. And and a very important thing is bacteria don't stick to it. It's like if it gets infected, you can give the patient antibiotics and it will keep the mesh in place. Yeah, I was told Dynamesh that makes the PVDF, uh, which is the brand of the PDF PVTF mesh uh, out of Germany. Uh, that's being used in many parts of Europe, maybe also Asia. They tried to penetrate the U.S. market. It just was too onerous. It's very difficult to penetrate the market because there are some giant companies that are yeah. that actually own the entire area, and very difficult. I use it extensively. You use the Dynamesh. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that your primary mesh that you use? Yeah. And having used the prior polypropylene and maybe even polyester meshes, how do you, as a surgeon, how does it feel differently working with a PVDF mesh? Yes, uh, in terms of the actual handling, it's like mm -hmm. uh, it's very much like polypropylene, but okay. it, but the post-op behaves differently. Really, they're not as swollen. Yeah. yeah. Locally. Yeah. I feel that. Well, it's being proven nowadays that some of the current polypropylene meshes are using resins that have a lot more impurities than the polypropylene Marlex resin that yeah. was originally used. I wonder if that's a reason why we're seeing so much more inflammation and local pain from hernia repairs that we didn't see before. I think also that it's it's very it's a little little details that make a difference if the mesh is woven or not woven, for mm -hmm. instance, because it's woven, it contains a lot of small little fibers, uh, and each of these fibers sort of like creates its own inflammatory reaction around it, and the bacteria can hide between these fibers. Yeah. Uh, so... You think sheets are better? No, not sheets, but. Uh, mm. 
Well, it's not, you can create a non-woven mesh, which is made of like a uh, compressed uh, mesh. Compressed. So it's, it's not really move. Uh, I believe, but I don't think it is. I mean, it's been shown in labs, but I don't think that it was shown clinically to have an, any advantage. But I think a big, a big advantage, except for robotics, uh, what we really need as the next big step for hernia repair would be better tissue replacement. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I remember, I don't know if you remember, the, at the American Hernia Society, we used to have these debates called the Great Debate um, or the Great Mesh Debate. I forget which, which term we used. And um, one year we had each, <clears throat> each company was represented on a panel. So there was a there was this surgeon that spoke on behalf of Gore. <clears throat> there was a surgeon that spoke on behalf of Bard. At that point, um, as at the con, and so on, uh, and I think, uh, well, before Covidian, I think it was U.S. Surgical, and they each pre presented why they think their mesh is better, and I was the I was like the host, and. I, I said, you know, at, at one point, this is a long time ago, I'm going to say it's probably 2006, maybe five, something like that. I said, at one point, we're all going to tell our grandchildren, yeah, it's crazy, right? We used to put plastic in people and we thought that was okay. And my prediction was that we were going to move towards a more natural uh, products to implant and kind of use your own bodies. But, but think body. of it. But think of. But think of it. We use it. We use you know tooth fillings for the last century. They hardly changed. Yeah. Uh, we use the uh, joints, joint replacements that are still made of metal for the last uh, thirty years. Yeah. They they they're better. They perform better. The operations are better. But they, they essentially we 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 implant the same. And you know, when you implant a knee, it's, it's probably the weight of like 500 meshes. And yes, correct. So we are using we are using artificial materials, foreign materials, but we can probably find you know very very sophisticated compound materials that will work will work better or will resemble much more uh, natural materials or our body. Yeah, I'm very hopeful because you may know my practice. It does uh, cater to people that are, have had complications from hernia repairs. And as part of that, I'm seeing people that just in general are having a much more difficult recovery from hernia repairs than they used to. And also that we have um, people that their body is just reacting to whatever is being implanted into them, whether that's a environmental thing or uh the, the actual product of the mesh may be impure. We don't know, but I'm seeing much more of it and it's just not right. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not right to me to, to implant a product that I'm not sure is approved in its current state. It may have been at one time, but th th things may have changed and I'm very uncomfortable with that. Well, I agree, you know, but I still think that uh, uh, using current meshes is is better than you know than having a 30 percent uh, recurrence rate so yeah and, true. And, and still and still most of the patients where you implant a mesh and you do it the right way and you don't fix it aggressively and you do the right dissection they're very happy most of yeah. the patients are very happy because you cater to complications you see a lot of them i but see a it's lot completely yeah. is is this I do the same, but it's disproportional to the number of patients that are really happy and never come back to you. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, one of the, these questions came up uh, right as we were going to start. I want to talk about it, about not necessarily fixing hernias, but actually detecting hernias. I misspoke earlier about augmented, um, uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, talking about augmented reality, but maybe artificial intelligence can help better detect hernias, at least on imaging. There, I know there's some talk, some discussions about using AI to be like your radiologist. Um, what do you think about that? So first of all, what I think about is that 99% of hernias could be 
uh, diagnosed without any imaging. Uh, True. On, it could be diagnosed by a, by an experienced doctor who knows how to examine a patient, talk to a patient, and examine the patient. Uh, and in these cases, you don't need any imaging. The imaging is needed when you are not sure that what causes the patient's complaints, which is mostly pain. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you will send the patient for imaging to to find reasons why the patient has pain that are disproportional to what you find on your physical examination. So if you don't really palpate a hernia in all techniques that you learn how to palpate a hernia, and you, the patient has a lot of pain, you need to know why the patient has pain, and then you send to imaging. The problem with ultrasound, unless you perform it yourself, which I think mm -hmm. is a good idea, is a very good idea, is that it's very, very operator dependent. So yeah. whoever is in, and you never know if it's if the guy who did or the person who did the ultrasound is trustworthy or are they good and do I understand their real anatomy, especially in the groin of the understanding yeah. anatomy. So when I am not sure, I don't send my patients to ultrasound. I send them either to CT scan or MRI. Yes. And in Israel, in Israel, we have a program that you can also send a patient for MRI on exertion, MRI, on, uh, so you can, yes. you, can, it, you can show better uh, the hernia. And I, the I, surgeon myself, I need to learn how to look at this. And AI can help you because the, in in uh, in these circumstances, uh, it can give you because these are all measurable things. So it can give you hints about what what you're seeing. What the the thing is that. You know, Growing pain, especially in young men, uh, is an issue. And many times, when you when there is a, a very tiny hernia and you fix it, the pain doesn't go away or even increases. And you have to be very careful with patients, uh, even if you are a patient. If you have growing pain, uh, to make sure that you are sure that the operation is actually going to help you, because a very very small hernia. That's right. It's not life threatening. It's only in, it's the only issue here is quality of life. Yes, you're not you saving your life. Sure. Absolutely. So you have to make sure that an operation or a procedure will improve your quality of life because sometimes it can worsen. Very true. Which is why I'm I'm not I'm a big proponent of watchful waiting, especially for these patients who have no symptoms. I don't agree that well you're going to eventually get need the repair done. So let's just do it now. I think. You know, I tell my patients it's your choice. I tell my patients it's your choice. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. life threatening. Yeah. If it's going to be big, it's going to be a bigger operation. So you have to consider right. that and make your decision when you're ready for surgery. Come back. That's right. And what percentage of your practice is uh, hernia related? Mm, probably about sixty percent. Wow, that's wonderful. Okay, mm -hmm. I have an idea that I would love for you to be able to figure it out because you, you have the smarts and the, the, the team for it. We need to figure out a pain sensor. I'll give you an example. Uh, people say they have pain, whatever. Then I take them to surgery. And I think based on my physical exam and the history and the imaging that their pain is from, let's say a mesh that's balled up or uh, a nerve that's entrapped in scar tissue, okay? I would like to know when I can stop operating. In other words, when did I address the pain? So for example, triple neurectomy, I don't think we need to do every single nerve cut, right? When do I know that I've addressed the pain by let's say the, the nerve in question, and I don't have to start looking for other reasons and do a much bigger operation? Maybe like a monitor, that has like a brain level scan, and then once I but there's there the there's nerve, all, it goes down to there's zero. Already, there's actually already something in what? the in this direction. Okay, tell me. But it's no, there is actually a way to beginning to be a way to measure pain objectively. Okay. Or at least semi objectively, but yes, uh, but it's not a it's not a it's not a commercial product yet. But it's, yeah. is that, that, that sounds doable where, you know, you can kind of, okay, pain's at 20 right now. And I cut this air, this nerve, let's say, and it goes down to one. 
you know, the problem, I, I got when you cut, the problem is that when you cut your nerves, these nerves, these patients are under some kind of anesthesia. So that's true. And you're blocking these nerves anyway. So it's centrally. That's true. So it's going to be better to follow patients up before and after surgery, but during surgery is not, I'm not, I don't think it's going to help you. I just feel like it would be, it would be so nice if we had a guide as to. Uh, I, I think other ways will be, for instance, to uh, manipulate the nerve conduction externally by magnets, magnetic fields, or uh -huh. shock, shock, uh, ultrasound, focus ultrasound. And then you can do it without surgery and go gradually and ask the patient because this is not painful. Ask the patient, how is he doing now and how is he doing now? Yeah. So I think this will probably under MRI guidance, for instance, uh, might be a good thing to do. Yeah, so many great ideas out there that need the idea, then you got to be able to execute it, and then you it needs to be a financially solvent Mm -hmm. business plan absolutely a lot of barriers but congratulations barriers, which which is also good because then it filters out bad things true but congratulations to you for being such a great surgeon is so involved i see you at every single meeting uh, that i go to and then you're operating so much so you're helping patients on a one-to-one -one level but more importantly you're developing innovations that can improve care especially hernia care as a whole it's just fantastic i love it if i could thank you so much i don't know if i could be uh i don't know if i'll have the energy to ever like be like someone like you but i think it will be an ideal ideal life but, to have but you are you so do it you're thing. using another using other technologies like zoom for instance that's true you, <laughs> yeah you make it by being a huge impact using a technology yeah yeah exactly right yeah for sure. I think, uh, I guess we're all doing our own, our own little part. I just love watching right. the ideas come to fruition and then using it. I just think that's a great cycle. So thank yeah, you for that. I agree. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Well, everyone, that was a fantastic, fantastic hour. Hold on one second. Um, that's the end, Amiki. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who logged in live and those of you that are watching uh, later. Thank you all for joining me on Hernia Talk Live. Uh, we have guests from all around the world every week. Please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc and on Facebook at Dr. Tofi, where you can watch this video as well as on my YouTube channel at Hernia Doc. I will have another fantastic guest next week, but I appreciate you. It's what 11 o'clock at night right now. It yeah. definitely would have been past my bedtime, but I do appreciate, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs>